Okay, cool. Uh, And mic number two. DSA, uh, and I'm honored to be uh, chairing this session with my good friend and comrade, Brendan O'Connor. A uh, bit of admin before we get into it. Uh, a reminder, all socialism conference attendees are required to wear masks, fully covering the nose and mouth while indoors in conference spaces, including hallways and meeting rooms. Speakers from the front of sessions may remove their masks in order to deliver their presentations, but only while actively speaking. And audience members are still required to wear masks even while asking questions or making comments. The mask policy is in place to protect all of us, especially the immunocompromised, from the risk of contracting COVID-19. The conference community safety plan relies in part on badge checkers at the door of each room and all attendees are expected to wear their conference badges at all times to enter conference meeting rooms. Please respect the badge checkers and know they are here to support a safe conference. You can see registration if you have any problems. All right, so uh, Brendan O'Connor uh, is a good friend and comrade of mine, uh, a great organizer, uh, a PhD candidate, 
at the City of, Uni City of uh, University of New York uh, Grad Center in Geography, and the author of Blood Red Lines, How Nativism Fuels the Right, which is available right over there in the bookshop. I'll leave that there. <laughs> Go buy it. New paperback edition with a, with a, with a fresh preface. Uh, I'm not going to dilly-dally any further. I'm going to hand it off to, to Brendan. Thank you, Justin. Um, thank you all for being here. I really, really appreciate you coming out on uh, Sunday morning to talk about fascism. Um, everyone's dreams start to a beautiful day. Um, I want to thank Haymarket and all the sponsoring organizations for putting on this great weekend. Um, all the other panelists and speakers, uh, it's been a privilege to listen and learn from everyone. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so I'm going to speak a little bit uh, about, well, actually I'm not gonna speak about the book. I'm going to continue thinking <laughs> with all of you about the things that I thought about in this book um, as they continue to change. <clears throat> Earlier this summer, someone asked me if I am for or against immigration. Mind you, this was at a wedding here in Chicago between the son of an Irish American and a Mexican immigrant and the daughter of Vietnamese immigrants. Still, it was a more difficult question to answer than it might seem. I am, as no doubt all of us here are, for a world in which every, every person's needs are met and in which they and their kin are able to thrive wherever they choose to live, either in their place of birth or on the other side of the planet. But that is not our world, at least not yet. In our world, more narrowly, in this country, to say that one is for immigration is on one level to signal one's affinity for a certain set of discourses about diversity, melting pots, the tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and all the rest of it. These ideas are near and dear to the hearts of well-meaning liberals and progressives and constitute a significant part of the common sense of many more Americans besides. But these ideas also obscure the material realities of migration, the living and working conditions of migrants, and critically, the divergent regimes of policing, surveillance, and regulation to which migrants are subject by a state that categorizes them as documented or undocumented, refugees or asylum seekers, in other words, deserving or undeserving. For the past three decades or so, the militarization of the US-Mexico border and the increasingly fascistic internal enforcement apparatus have contributed to the production of a permanent, settled, undocumented labor force. Millions of people, many of whom otherwise, li many of whom likely otherwise would have engaged in circular migration, now locked in place as a hyper-exploitable, precisely because they are deportable, fraction of the domestic working class. If we got rid of CBP and ICE tomorrow, however, the crisis conditions that such migrants live every day would not be resolved citizenship and the rights that come with it, however attenuated, would remain locked behind another, in some respects, even more daunting border of bureaucracy. In what has become yet another of her famous formulations, doubtless invoked a dozen times already this weekend, Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us <clears throat> that abolition is about presence, not absence. Just as prison abolition does not simply mean the knocking down of walls and the universal release of the incarcerated, although it does mean that, and police abolition does not simply mean the removal of police from our streets and our lives, although it does mean that. Border abolition does not simply mean the disappearance of border patrols, surveillance drones, ICE raids, and detention centers, although it does mean that. What then must be present to abolish the border? what must be present for someone to make a home in an unfamiliar place. It is common sense that the state is needed to provide care, housing, and support for refugees, asylees, and other migrant populations. But what happens when that responsibility is left solely to the state, and not just the state in the abstract, but the late neoliberal crisis state, the anti-state state? Let's get even more specific. In the past year or so, 
Some 100,000 asylum seekers have either made their own way to New York City or been bused there, that is, trafficked, by border states. These are people who must be cared for, even if Mayor Eric Adams has sought to challenge the right to shelter available to anyone in the city. Tabloids like The Post are careful to note how much it is costing taxpayers to house and feed asylum seekers, without, of course, investigating what conditions are in the mayor's new ostensibly temporary respite centers. Exempt from even the, the meager regulations that apply to the city's shelter system, many of these centers are run by private contractors. One is located in a shuttered state prison in Harlem, another in a warehouse at the JFK airport, formerly used as a USPS overflow facility, a third in the old police academy in Manhattan. Activists, elected politicians, and members of the media have only been allowed limited access. Rumors and reports of violence and abuse from security staff inside abound, seeming to acknowledge that people cannot live in rooms packed with cots three mere feet apart, three showers for 300 people. The mayor's press secretary described the centers as waiting rooms. Confronted with evidence that some asylum seekers have been forced to remain in shelters for days on end, he said, it's a waiting room for as long as it takes. Responding to pressure from both Mayor Adams and elected officials representing the smaller upstate cities now also being asked to house migrants, Governor Kathy Hochul demanded greater aid from President Biden and the federal government. And fair enough, the federal government should intervene more assertively. There is, of course, a twist. In a public address, Hochul said, quote, for me, the answer to these two crises, a humanitarian crisis and our workforce crisis, is so crystal clear and common sense. Let them get the work authorizations. Let them work. Legally, let them work. According to Adams, if federal funds are not increased and migrants not authorized to work, the city is going to be, quote unquote, decimated. The origin of the threat, though, is muddled. Adams speaks in terms of forces beyond human control. Quote, when the storm hit upstate, they called New York City. New York City has always been here for the entire state, he said, speaking of the flooding in the Hudson Valley earlier this summer before going on. Quote, the storm of migrant asylum seekers have hit us for over a year now. We need help. But Adams has also made it clear that his administration will start kicking asylum seekers out of respite centers, leaving them on the street. Indeed, even as Adams urges the federal government to move to integrate migrants into the formal workforce, the NYPD is raiding these shelters, confiscating, that is, stealing, the mopeds that they use either to get to work or in the course of their work. So it is that the crises are converging. <clears throat> Hundreds of thousands of displaced and dispossessed migrants provide the solution for the crisis of an aging labor force in a post-industrial economy driven increasingly by service and care work. That migrant workers, whether made to move by war, climate change, economic conditions, or some combination of the three, are already in a state of extreme vulnerability and precarity, living and working under the gaze of both the state and the boss, means that they are even more readily exploited than citizen workers. Despite the valiant efforts of groups like the Black and Arab Migrant Solidarity Alliance or NYC Ice Watch, tens of thousands of new New Yorkers cannot be cared for through mutual aid networks and activist efforts alone, nor should they have to be. But we cannot abandon that responsibility to the state either. Without the social infrastructure of inclusion that makes the city into a home for all who live there, regardless of how or when they arrived, the machinery of exclusion will grow in its place. In recent weeks, aggressive protests have targeted migrant shelters. In Sunset Park, migrants from one part of the world demand the exclusion of those from another. On Staten Island, mobs of homeowners, descendants of yet another much earlier wave of immigration, scream, go back where you came from, at buses full of asylum seekers. The journalist Molly Osberg described the scene. <clears throat> Some residents sat on lawn chairs drinking from solo cups next to a two-story banner that read, no effing way. On one lawn, a woman who lived on the block and declined to give her name lamented that migrants received free health care. The media wants to say we don't want them here, that we want them in other places. She said, that's not true. We don't want them anywhere. A man next to her pulled up a photograph of his Sicilian grandfather and on his phone to illustrate what it looks like when an immigrant comes to America, quote unquote, the right way. Across the street, a 68-year-old woman named Debbie held a cardboard sign reading, hey, Adams, the crackers are here. A self-described libertarian, she said she was concerned about crime and disease from the people staying in the school. Why not put them on Rikers, she asked. It's a contained space where you can vet them and give them all kinds of medical tests. Around 300 migrants were supposed to be housed in the Staten Island Respite Center, Respite Center, a former school. 
Only 20 were there at the time of the last official count, and fewer every day as the demonstrations continue. Direct action, as they say, gets the goods. One mother at a recent anti-migrant protest on Staten Island told a local broadcaster, quote, we love people, we just want to protect our children. Protect them from what? It is simultaneously unclear and abundantly clear, both totally vague and incredibly specific. She was invoking years of propaganda targeting trans people, drag queens, critical race theory, woke mobs, cancel culture, you know the list. Every new front that opens in the so-called culture wars, disorienting as it may be, is a new venue in the production of a reactionary politics that proclaims itself as returning to tradition, but is really a process of creating something new. The fascist threat mobilized by and around the promised return to a mythic romantic past does not consist in the realization of that return. After all, even if it were possible to turn back the clock, that imagined past never really happened to begin with. But even failed attempts at recreation might conjure something new. The attempt to recreate the old ends up creating something hypermodern. Why do so many of these moral panics revolve around children and imagine threats to their well-being? It is worth remembering one of the most enduring white supremacist slogans, the infamous 14 words. Quote, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, end quote. This is just making the implicit explicit. Why are so many of the demonized figures adults who are in some way responsible for children? On one level, what motivates this is straightforward bigotry, racism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny. On another level, though, it seems to me that taken all together, we can see this as a multi-pronged assault on the practices of social reproduction. Seen from this perspective, who are the targets? Librarians, teachers, educators of all stripes, as well as their unions and even the institutions themselves. This is happening across the country at various scales. Humanities and social science departments are being disintegrated, consolidated, or outright disbanded, even as shiny new STEM buildings spring up out of the ground. How long even these will contain students remains to be seen. Any lab tech or web developer who thinks his work isn't subject to the same pressures of automation and intensification is in for an ugly surprise. Even as we set aside fear-mongering and myth-making about so-called artificial intelligence, automation, and large language models, we can recognize the implications that a significant leap forward in technological development has for various kinds of labor, which is to say they are the same implications that they always are, to the extent that living labor is replaced with dead labor. Fixed capital, machinery, technology, whatever you want to call it, that living labor is rendered surplus. Some of those workers will find jobs in industries and sectors that still require human hands, the rest must fend for themselves. They are now surplus. Surplus to what? To the requirements of capital. Except capital also requires this surplus. The surplus is, of course, the infamous reserve army of labor upon which capital can draw as needed, a mass of unwaged or underpaid workers desperate to put food on the table who might be used to break strikes, for example, or be put to work in new extensive regimes of accumulation as the need for living labor increases again or simply as an ambient threat against the formerly employed, formally employed, waged working class who can be induced to accept conditions they might not otherwise for fear of slipping into the abyss. The more brutally the lumpen proletariat are treated, publicly and privately, by cops and guards and judges, the more reason for the proletariat to stay in line. Our conjuncture is marked by dramatic shifts in the capitalist state's management of this surplus population globalization, deindustrialization, the neoliberal turn. These were not only accompanied, but made possible in many places by the warehousing of surplus racialized labor. In the 1970s and 1980s, big capital and its allies, the cops, the landlords, the real estate developers, the financiers, clawed back the political territory gained by movements of workers and the oppressed in the decades preceding. The revolutionary tide was stemmed and something new took its place, the law and order society. Social problems were not resolved, but disappeared into the abyss of jails and prisons, as were the revolutionaries who sought to do something about them. This strategy, sorry to say, has been quite effective. Too many on the outside remain convinced that these problems are someone else's. As ever, the goal is, the goal is pacification, not progress. If it was the crisis of Keynesianism and New Deal great society liberalism that created the conditions for neoliberal, neoliberalism's rise under Ford, Ford and Carter, its consolidation under Reagan, and having passed through the high neoliberalism of the Clinton, Bush, and Obama years, 
we now find ourselves confronting what might be dubbed the crisis of late neoliberalism. How deep does this crisis run? Looking to the political sphere, we find nothing short of a clown show. At the national level, the GOP is in disarray, riven by infighting. Its flagship propaganda network, Fox News, flailing in the aftermath of several devastating lawsuits, and its presidential candidate, Trump, under indictment, however many times over now, with no challenger capable of credibly breaking his hold on the base. At the state level and the level of the judiciary, of course, it remains as powerful as ever, possibly even more so. Democrats, meanwhile, are unpopular, but somehow managing to hold it all together, maybe even shifting the national common sense with legislative packages like the CHIPS Act and the IRA about what kinds of economic interventions are necessary and permissible, legislation shaped in part by bipartisan anxiety and aggression about China. Pundits and commentators can't seem to make up their minds as to whether the Biden economy is good or not. Basically, people are still struggling to pay their bills, but it could be a lot worse. Meanwhile, the climate crisis looms as large as ever. Fossil fuel capital, which created that crisis, stands to gain the most from its resolution. And all the while, people keep arriving at and crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, seeking refuge, asylum, and work. At the beginning of the Biden administration, Vice President Kamala Harris warned migrants, if you come to our border, you will be turned back. Somehow, this has proven unpersuasive. Borders do not stop people from moving, <clears throat> but they are a determinate factor in producing the circumstances of that movement, how people get where they're going, and what their life might be like when they arrive. Borders are Janus-like, facing both inward and outward, backwards in history and forward into the future, like prisons produced in crisis, used to resolve crisis, and productive of the crises to come. A key component in the machinery of exclusion, which appears designed to keep people out, Borders are really about what some in feminist and migrant studies refer to as differential inclusion, that is, determining the conditions of their arrival, their existence, and their labor. In the era of globalization, we often hear about capital's mobility as against labor's fixity. But this is not the whole story, only a part of it. Capital has ever been in motion. Indeed, capital is value in motion, motion through space and time, but also through forms. It is in this process of transformation that value is created, or more precisely, extracted from the living labor of the workers who make the transformation possible. So capital moves, yes, but it has always moved. It congeals and evaporates, contracts and explodes, having taken the shape of a building or a bridge or a commodity on a container ship from Shenzhen to Long Beach, it aches to be transformed again. Valorization and devaluation pulling each other forward, lurching through history. Labor is like this too both fixed in place and free to move, as dictated by the needs of capital. Workers are themselves always on the move, free, except when they are not. Borders, jails, prisons, schools, hospice centers, hospitals, psych wards, rehabs, halfway houses, refugee camps, detention centers, all manner of spaces regulating and managing the movement of the working class. Passage through, between, and within these spaces produces differentiation produces subjects, produces consciousness. What marks our conjuncture further is not necessarily the contradiction between capital's relative mobility and labor's relative fixity, both of which disguise the materiality of fixed capital and mobile labor, but the proliferation of kinds of spaces between which capital and labor alike might move, and the kinds of borders, barriers, and boundaries through and over which they might pass. The freedom of the migrant, quote unquote, of the migrant worker thus underscores the long historical contradiction of free labor, ostensibly free to pick up and move through and across borders in search of work and thereby subject to ever greater regimes of surveillance and control, regardless of legal status. Whatever theoretical support left critics of border abolition might think to find in Marx's theory of the reserve army of labor is here undercut. The argument basically is that the presence of migrants in a national labor market suppresses wages. This was the standard position of organized labor in various left parties for many decades, and it gives far too much credit to capitalists, assuming that in a tighter labor market, they would simply start paying more. Indeed, this takes bourgeois economic theories of supply and demand at face value. In fact, what makes wages go up is workers demanding higher wages and having the power to make it so. What makes wages go down is capital's ability to immobilize the workers' movement. That immobilization is managed 
through the infrastructure of race and racism, which is itself changing over time, responsive to the wider historical situation as it unfolds. Questions of who counts, who has history, and who is cast aside, who is waste, who is surplus, are back on the table. A very narrow notion of inclusion has exploded across scales. The home as private property, an asset constantly threatened by devaluation, here articulated as a threat from the as a threat, here articulated as a threat from the dispossessed racialized other, against which value must be protected through the fortressification at the level of the family, the neighborhood, the community, the city, the nation, which is also the home. Is this not just the raw material of racial capitalism? And if so, what makes it fascistic? Crisis, the inability of the system to reproduce itself as it has done. Literal, actual, historical Oliver North recently declared American universities to be hotbeds of Marxism, describing them as socialist re-education camps. And we know what Oliver North thinks ought to be done in such cases to the people branded as such. Because what does this really signify? Not simply a threat to capital, because I think we can all admit that as many exciting, dynamic, and even revolutionary efforts as there are developing in this moment, we are still far from the war of maneuver. We're barely in the war of position. So why do they bother? Because it's not accumulation as such that is threatened, but a crisis of the internal contradictions of capital that needs resolving. A crisis of overaccumulation that requires release, that requires further disinvestment, from the few remaining public institutions that work for working people, and in, fact not simply and in fact not simply disinvestment, but frontal assault on the gains made in struggle for ethnic studies, queer studies, women's studies, trans studies, and black studies. Fear-mongering about and reaction against critical race theory, or a professor who, supports, who voices support for Palestine, or one who stands up for her students' bodily autonomy and reproductive justice is not simply about those things, but it's not pure sublimation either. The Zionist lobby really does want anyone who isn't on board to shut up or get fired. But this also exists in an even broader political project to recompose ruling blocks at the scale of the city, region, nation, hemisphere, planet. And what is the response to this? Here we come to the problem of anti-fascism in crisis. That is to say, the problem of how to be anti-fascist in a time of crisis and how to be anti-fascist when anti-fascism is itself in crisis. As for the latter, we face a double-edged problematic in the mainstreaming of both fascism and anti-fascism. Biden Democrats have explicitly sought to position themselves as leading a popular front, co-opting radical critiques of fascism that implicate liberals and centrists in its rise, both in the United States and abroad. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the GOP has absorbed Trumpist fascism so thoroughly that a Ron DeSantis, Son and Rad meme army looks silly and pointless. What are they trying to outflank? If I take anything away from the cycles of anti-fascist protest and struggle that began roughly in 2015, it's that even as the electoral sphere remains an important one in the making and remaking of fascist politics, we cannot allow the rhythm of our analysis or our practice to be dictated by the tempo of elections if we are serious about articulating an anti-fascist politics that is not simply going to get swamped by a liberalism frantically grasping for legitimacy. If the ultimate goal of the anti-fascist struggle is not to defeat fascism as such, but to make a world in which fascism cannot exist to begin with, then we must begin working our way towards something like an everyday anti-fascism. There are times when public space must be defended, Proud Boys and neo-Nazis confronted, fascists chased out of town. But I'm not sure that such spectacles make for a durable, reproducible mass movement that can push beyond defense. Still, there is something unsatisfying to me about simply declaring the necessity of this. It's both obvious and nonspecific, verging on alarmist. Fascism is everywhere all the time. This is no way to live, but for the fact that its constituent parts are everywhere all the time and do require constant vigilance. If you, will, if you will permit me, I'm going to close with a brief personal anecdote. Last summer, I was working in a pizza restaurant in Brooklyn and organizing a union with my coworkers. It had been rumored that the owner's adult children were being paid an allowance through payroll, but we never knew for sure. What we did confirm was that the owner was paying to support his adult children's filmmaking careers, luminaries of the self-described reactionary downtown Manhattan art scene known as Dimes Square. 
When it became public that the boss was a producer on the kids' most recent bit of fascistic, transphobic propaganda, we put our heads together. What were we going to do? We hadn't won a union yet. The organizing drive wasn't even above ground. At that point, we'd really only had a few organizing committee meetings. So we kept pushing. We talked to our coworkers who were understandably upset about how the profits of our labor were being put to ends that none of us supported. We kept building, kept organizing, and a year later won a unanimous wall-to-wall -wall election. Now those, <laughs> now those workers have a tool with which to keep building power in the workplace for themselves, their friends, and their families, and a foothold for organized labor in an industry riven by borders that would cease to function altogether without the labor of immigrants. No union is automatically or necessarily anti-fascist or abolitionist, but organization is the prerequisite to put these politics into practice, to both defend our comrades, our loved ones, and ourselves, and to build a world where all can live and move freely under conditions of their own choosing. Thank you. Okay, um, so we have time now for, for questions. So what I'm gonna do is I will ask you all to Raise your hands, I'll recognize you. Uh, we'll do three at a time and you'll have three minutes to make your comments slash questions and then we'll do another round. Um, okay. Don't be shy. Well, thanks very much, Brendan. I'm David from uh, Tijuana, Mexico. Um, migrant city. Uh, just two, two comments. Uh, the first one is that uh, I think it's important for all of us to be more and more aware of uh, the many countries in the Caribbean, Central America, and South America that have suffered United States intervention over many, many, many decades or decades ago that has caused so much uh, uh, instability with uh, with those particular countries and has sometimes resulted in a failed state. And as a result, the working force, the migrant working force has to leave um, just to be able to survive and feed themselves and their families. So you got to get to the root cause of a lot of the mass migration that we're experiencing out of the Caribbean countries, Central America and South America. Um, and the root cause goes back to this country. Um, the second thing is that it's already been tallied uh, uh, over and over again. The millions and millions of dollars that have been paid into the Social Security system by non-documented workers in the United States, um, and they never reap the benefits of what they've paid in because, for example, you could go downtown Los Angeles and buy a social security number for about $35. And that social security number is usually tied into somebody who had passed away years ago. So they're able to do a, a, take on a temporary job with minimum wage and pay into a system that they'll uh, never be able to, to get back when they reach retirement age, if they reach retirement age. And the second thing is that besides them paying the millions of dollars over the years into Social Security here in the United States, they're giving a big, big break to the corporations or the businesses that are hiring them on and paying a lousy wage without providing any of the perks like paying into a, a health or, or a insurance plan, any kind of a retirement plan. So those corporations and big businesses are really making a lot of money off of uh, non-documented workers in the country. So it's basically those two commentaries. Feel free to raise your hand and I'll recognize you. Good job, Brendan. Um, my question, yeah, my question is about the term that you use in your book, border fascism, and here you talk about borders and you talk about fascism, but you don't say border fascism, so I'd like to hear what you think about that. 
Anybody else? Hi everyone, Alejandra from Tucson, Arizona, um, a soul in Tohono O'odham land. Um, I guess one thing where sometimes I feel stuck is how do we engage the people who are not necessarily interested or know about anti-fascism, how do we engage them? How do we engage or I guess liberal comrades in understanding that these issues are not going to be fixed by voting for a Democrat in the next election. And um, I guess, sorry, I don't like speaking in front of people, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> um, and the other thing, I guess, um, I'm kind of also wondering, how do we make this transnational, you know? I'm originally from Hermosillo, Sonora, um, south from the border, and as more um, migrants have been coming to the border and getting stuck in places like Tijuana and Nogales, anti-immigrant rhetoric has been increasing. Um, and it's something very painful for me to see as someone who's living on this side now. So I'm wondering how do we make this movement transnational? Yeah, thank you for all of those comments and questions. Um, Alejandra, your, your first question is, I think, uh, absolutely a critical, critical one, and it's one that I think all of us are struggling with. And, and, and I suppose it is it's like kind of both a dodge and also just true <laughs> that uh, this is what I was trying to get to towards the end of this bit of writing, that durable and reproducible organizations are the things that are able to bring people into struggle outside of and between the spectacular events um, and to politicize people in struggle in ways that, in unexpected ways, <laughs> in ways that they are not expecting um, when they come to be involved. And as organizers, as theorists, as intellectuals, I think part of our role and our part of our responsibility is when we are organizing with people and when we are in struggle with people to keep in view all of the, the, the different scales of struggle that are either already unfolding and developing or are yet to come, which is to say that like in organizing this this labor union in in the pizza shop, we didn't start that around the object of um, like defending our trans comrades, <laughs> right? Like that wasn't necessarily the immediate um, widely felt, deeply felt demand, um, but we were able to kind of help people make sense of that as part of the project that we were building. And it is part of what, it is part of the organizational fabric now. Um, and this happens, I don't think that this is something that can be forced. It is something that requires a lot of really careful cultivation. Um, and I don't think that there is a I don't think there's a playbook for it, really, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I think if there were, we would all be a lot further along already. Um, so I don't mean to like defer on your question, because I think it is the question <laughs> in the question. Um, yeah, I mean, and so I think like or it, the, that the, that the solutions present themselves in movement, in struggle, and in organization, and not necessarily, as I said, when in like the moments of, of enormous upsurge and spectacle, um, but in the kind of quiet moments between, between, in the quiet time, between those things, when you are preparing. Um, your second question and David's comments about um, US regional hegemony um, and how to make these struggles 
you, I think you said transna transnational, not international. And I think that's an important distinction um, <clears throat> in a book called No One is Illegal, co-authored by Justin Aker Chacon and Mike Davis. They kind of talk about not an international working class, but a hemispheric working class. Uh, kind of understanding borders as, or kind of approaching a way of, of, of conceptualizing um, the working class in a regional way, in a hemispheric way that doesn't reproduce nation states and borders, that to, in saying the international working class, we're kind of assuming domestic labor markets as discrete things. And yes, that is important in thinking about the international division of labor and that, you know, big capital uses borders and these divisions to create differentials and yada, yada, yada. We all know that. But at the level of organizing <laughs> and at the level of kind of building a transnational movement, I do think it is important to kind of remember that the working class is always already in motion across borders and is not, it does, <laughs> the working class does not respect capitalist borders. Um, nor should we in our, in our organizing. Um, this goes the other way, because as you say, the reaction against migrants is not just something that comes, comes top down. This is, this is, there, is, there is horizontal violence um, within, within that hemispheric working class. Uh, and it's really tough to see. And it's really tough to know how to, how to deal with that, how to, how to bridge that divide. Um, because it means thinking with some, not sympathy, but empathy about why people would react in that way and understanding what are their conditions, what are the ideas, why are these ideas resonating with them and shaping their, the way that they are moving in the world and the way that they are reacting to new arrivals in their homes. <clears throat> um, and those conditions are gonna be different, like those conditions are different in Staten Island versus Tijuana. Um, so like local organizers, local intellectuals, local scholars, local revolutionaries kind of need to be able to make sense of that where they are. But there are obviously going to be commonalities and there are going to be parallels across, across these. And I think that this is where the, this is where theories of the reserve army of labor, theories of surplus populations, theories of um, racialized surplus are really useful and the kind of the fact that these, that these classes are, that the borders between these classes are porous and that um, movement between those is, is always precarious. Um, and so people, people's anxiety and people's fear becomes projected outwards. And how to deal with that is like, Someone could write a whole book about that. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe the next book, yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you for those questions and those comments. Um, Julia. <laughs> why didn't I, why didn't I not, so yeah, so in, so in, in my book, Blood Red Lines, now available in paperback, um, with a new, with a new preface from Haymarket. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I introduce and use the idea of border fascism um, as a, as a, to try and articulate a vision of a fascist movement, a fascist politics that is both, um, both spatialized, that is both uh, particular to the border region, the border lands, that is shaped by the relationship between vigilante movements, paramilitary movements, the state, the, rep the repressive apparatuses of the state in the border region um, of the US-Mexico border and the politics that kind of emerge from those practices and the subjectivities and consciousness that emerge from those practices. Um, yet another example of a place where previous generations of immigrants are absorbed into an anti-immigrant political apparatus. Um, 
but that border that but that that border fascism is not is not uh, territorially delimited. That it, border fascism that borders play an important role in fascist politics everywhere, and that borders are both a like legal and bureaucratic uh, topographical <laughs> line in the sand, so to speak but an ideology and, and a constitutive part of, an ide of, the, of the ruling ideology and an important piece that gets picked up on in a period of crisis when emerging fractions of the capitalist class are trying to recompose a ruling block, use these bits of common sense that people have about, well, I wouldn't, just, I wouldn't let just anybody into my house, so why would I let just anybody into the country? Surely we should have a border. Surely that border should have a wall. Surely that border should be policed. This is how common sense get built and then kind of picked apart and made into something different. Um, so to say in the book, I talk about border fascism as such to try and draw out what I see as like the central and determining factors in the particular uh, articulation of fascism in America in the 21st century, that the border is kind of the key component. Um, but you always risk, I think, a little bit in putting a qualifier in front of fascism, which you're talking about. Border fascism, racial fascism, gender fascism, body fascism. like. Isn't it just fasc isn't it just fascism? And so, it, you know, I, I go back and forth on the on the utility of mm, trying to emphasize which of the component parts um, are determining or determinate. But I do still think that in in this moment, in the, at the here at the beginning of the twenty first century, with the enormous amount of displacement that the climate crisis is going to cause around the, around the world, that, ha that it has caused already and that is continue to cause, people in movement are going to continue to kind of scramble the political common sense around the world. And borders are going to continue to be a <clears throat> key part of both the reactionary politics that emerge from that and the uh, liberatory politics that come from that. Um, I feel like I kind of lost the thread there for a bit, but uh, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Anybody uh, else? We can take three more questions. Okay, so... You right here, you right there, and then you right there. Yep. Hey, um, you just mentioned the um, climate crisis. I was just wondering, in terms of dealing with, um, in terms of the reaction to um, uh, immigration, and um, I was just wondering, like, how you think, or or if you've kind of been thinking through how the climate crisis is, is creating and will continue to create more internal refugees um, and how you think that might, um, you know, I don't know, increase the reaction or aggravate certain political aspects. Um, yeah, that, that's my whole question. Hello. Uh, I wonder if you could expand a little on the idea of uh, the crisis of anti-fascism, because I'm not certain exactly what that means, or is it simply that there is no anti-fascist movement and there needs to be one, and therefore we're sort of facing a crisis that way? I mean, I, I agree that fascism is hyper-nationalism and therefore has to use the border. <laughs> it's, it's, it's built into the, the structure or ideology of fascism. Either 
the border must be defended as today, or the border has to be expanded as under Hitler. So one way or the other, borders are essential. Um, the other thing I'm trying to f get my head around is previous uh, rising of fascist movements have been associated with historical defeats of the working class, failed revolutions, uh, squandered revolutionary chances, and then the forces of reaction come in and mop up a, a apparently powerless workers' movement. And I wonder how that relates to what we're facing today, in that we haven't had any tests that defeated, that showed the working class to be defeated. We, we seem not to have many tests at all historically, which bring about, you know, except for the Black Lives Matter movement, a, a few other, we see very few things on the scene which, which actually test these, these social forces at all. Um, and then finally, my, the, the anti-fascist movement, of course, has been largely in reaction to the organizing of the fascists. So they march, we respond, et cetera, et cetera. I've been to a, a couple of uh, sessions this, this weekend where I'm trying to get my head also around what does day-to-day anti-fascist organizing take mean aside from these big set piece events? One of the uh, one of the battlegrounds seems to be public libraries, and we had a session on that yesterday. And and it seems to me that that is precisely the place where we could get involved in everyday anti-fascist work. Is is you know uh, fighting the book bans, standing up for the librarians, and so on. Um, but I'm wondering what other avenues and, and, and areas that we can start developing the, the forces that we need to. Uh, where, where do we go from here? Thank you. All right. Well, I, thanks. Uh, I really appreciated your, you know, your, your talk, and I just wanted to say a couple of things. I took some notes, and I'm just going to try to get it all out fast and continue the discussion. You know, the, what the brother here was just saying, to me, uh, politics, uh, the fascism really represents a politics of despair, right? They, they don't, you know, they don't really have any solutions. They say they do, and they talk a lot, and they'll even adopt leftist sounding, you know, like slogans and stuff. But, you know, if you're smart enough to, to read through it, you know they're not, they're, that's not what they're about. And I've been active around anti-Klan work since well, since Carter was in the White House, so, you know, I'm, I'm an old guy, so, yeah. Uh, but I appreciate that you push back against electoralism, which I think, you know, a lot of people think, well, if we just vote for the right Democrat, we'll get, you know, we'll stop fascism, and, you know, everybody knows that's a load of bullshit. Sorry. But, you know, Comrade told me, like, 40-some-odd years ago, that, you know, that if we don't organize the white working class, they will. And that's what we're seeing now. You know, and I think, you know, if we look at the re recent evolution of the far right since the founding of the Tea Party, we're seeing the mainstreaming of white nationalism, of Christian, uh, Christian nationalism in ways that you've never seen in the past. And it's different. It's not, used to be you, you knew who the players were, you know, National Alliance, the Klan, and stuff like that. And you knew where they were going to go, what they were going to do. And you could go and you know, you, you outnumber them, you outmobilize them, and that, you know, and they would get demoralized and they would go drink and, you know, <laughs> sing Hitler songs and that would be it. But now we're seeing something different because they're moving into the electoral field. They're moving into the, the mainstream of the Republican Party, which is kind of frightening to see the, the, um, the evolution of the GOP, which doesn't mean that the Democrats are the alternative, obviously. But, you know, this is based on a material reality. I mean, Neoliberalism, the bipartisan offensive against the working class in this country, has hollowed out whole sections of the economy and whole sections of the country. If you go to places in Illinois or Iowa, places where there used to be a plant and it's gone, and all those people don't have jobs, they don't, you know, they lose their houses and everything else. So the left has, to me, seems to ha ha have the responsibility to have a programmatic response to answer some of these people's, you know, these fears. We can't just go, like Hillary Clinton, it's just a basket of deplorables and how terrible they are. They actually, and I appreciate when you say it, we have to have some empathy, yes. Doesn't mean adapting to their, their backwardness, but we definitely have to come up with some sort of 
programmatic approach, and I'm coming to the end, so oh, my time is almost done. But you know, job one is mobilizing the working class and the press, and getting this this message into the union through into the unions through education. You know, to talk about you know the the threat of fascism and the threat of the far right. So I tend not to use the word fascism too much. It's overused, but still. And all of this is because the ruling class is in crisis. They can't solve the climate crisis. They can't solve the economic crisis without undermining their paymasters on Wall Street. So that's it. <laughs> Chad, do you have a question? We'll, we'll, take, we'll take one more. Right, take one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and this, in disclosure, I, I know. Uh, the the, moder uh, the moderator and the and the panelists right now, um, but I, I do want to like explore the uh, question of um, uh, of armed resistance. I think there's you know a, when we, you know we have fascists. Remember, this is streaming live. <laughs> <laughs> when we have fascists, um, you know, targeting schools, targeting children, targeting trans people. Uh, I, I and I come. I was raised in a you know in an armed tradition, so I, I'm wondering if, like how that uh, figures into our work or or our like movement right now. Uh, it's just a question. I'm not like advocating for like this right now. I think it's a very interesting question. <laughs> I appreciate you raising that question theoretically in the abstract, hypothetically. <laughs> Satire, satire, parody. Um, no, I think that people uh, need to think creatively about what self-defense looks like under different conditions, in different legal contexts, and also to push the envelope um, because they're coming. Um, but I think also, while that is necessary, while that may be necessary, uh, Again, I think my emphasis or my concern or interest is in the organizing that happens between the moments of spectacular confrontation, um, which is not necessarily, I guess, to put those in opposition. Um, the one produces the other, uh, and the condition produces the conditions for the other. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm playing back everyone's questions and, and comments. Um, yeah, and I guess I, I guess I, I do, I do want to maybe revise, um, I don't know if empathy is, is, is exactly the right word. It's closer, it's closer than sympathy, but I guess just to be, to be scientific about it and to understand why people think what they do and why people believe what they do and to understand the circumstances that bring them into that position in order to change it, <laughs> in, in order to intervene, um, is like, what else are we here for, <laughs> right? That this is, this, is the entire, this is the entire task. Um, if the whole working class already had the correct ideas, we wouldn't need to be here. Um, I do think that the, as, as I alluded to in the talk, I think that um, schools, libraries, these, these, uh, th these are being targeted for a reason, um, both for the content of what is being taught there and the ideas that are being disseminated there by um, by radical teachers, by progressive educators, but also because of the, the nature of the space and the institution itself, which is to say that these are the spaces of social reproduction um, and that the crisis of capital in the wealthy post-industrial West right now is, I think, a crisis of social reproduction. Um, we have an aging workforce that is drawing down on that the social security that you were that you were talking about, and part of the, part of the way of maintaining and re, and and not resolving, but but putting off 
this crisis is through this enormous wealth transfer, uh, both from the global south to the global north, both in the form of uh, extracting surplus value at the point of production um, from hyper-exploitable, uh, deportable, undocumented labor, and also documented migrant labor. Um, but yeah, but that then they're that they're paying that they are paying into social security. Another that this is another form of wage theft, <laughs> social wage theft. Um, and so, defending. I mean, this is this is this is a this is a this is a contradiction, right? We want to defend the defend these spaces of social reproduction where they are working for working people. Um, like I'm thinking of like, I'm a student at CUNY at the City University of New York, uh, where like year after year, the state administration and the city is trying to get away with austerity budgets and we're constantly have to have, needing to fight to fund this institution. Um, or West Virginia University where they are just decimating um, departments and budgets. But also these are institutions that are about like training workers to be exploited, right? Like we kind of have to think, think uh, with some nuance about like defending but also building and defending in a way that allows us to build. Um, it's a contradiction. Uh, that is maybe that is maybe not in itself resolvable, um, but that's why being a revolutionary is hard. <laughs> uh, Katie's your question about how uh, that there is kind of the different kinds of displacement that are going to take place. I think is really is really astute. Um, most displacement around the world that has already happened as a result of climate change is internal displacement. People moving from one place to another, but remaining within their country of origin. It's not, they're still there. Um, not crossing borders to go from one place to another. Um, this is nevertheless disruptive. Um, and I think we can imagine both how this will produce both uh, crises and opportunities insofar as the displacement, like let's, you know, the displacement of people in, the, the displacement of citizens within in the US, people who are kind of already legible to the state recognized by the state, who enjoy certain rights and benefits of citizenship, privileges of, of citizenship, who are nevertheless displaced, dispossessed as a result of the climate crisis, in some spaces may be able to see some kind of solidarity <laughs> with people who do not enjoy those same benefits and privileges, be able to understand themselves as occupying a similar, to be in, a sim in similar conditions and similar in a similar subject position. We can also imagine that this will be an opportunity for people in that position to say, I'm first in line. And you do not like, and you're not my problem. And I think that that is something that we will need to, that people who are doing climate work, migrant justice work, all of, the, all of, all of this work um, will need to be sensitive to because I think those divisions that the crisis presents an opportunity to bridge th those divides or for th those divides to be deepened and it's up to us to make it the former and not the latter but it is not inevitable one way or the other there were a lot of other really great comments but i've lost track anybody else Your chair. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, you and then Martha and you with the yellow bandana. 
Um, hi, uh, my name is Mel Buer. Um, I am a movement journalist who previously covered labor movement in the Midwest. Um, it's kind of just a comment about, we've been having a lot of conversation about how to reach out to individuals and um, what it means to try and bring in individuals who are uh, generally not interested, right? Um, and I think it's interesting that you would call it empathy or sympathy or what have you, but you know, I've had, um, I've had the privilege to talk to a lot of workers during um, sort of moments of crisis, uh, during strikes, during pickets, right? Um, and a lot of folks uh, feel the same sort of pressures that capitalism kind of drops on your shoulder, right? Um, they feel this pressure, this crisis that's coming, right? And they, um, a lot of folks who generally you wouldn't talk to, who don't automatically point to the actual reason, um, are afraid, right? Um, and so they look for the thing that can, or the person that can explain their own personal sort of um, nightmare, right? Um, and individuals within the GOP or individuals who are expressly interested in pushing an ideology of fascism will point to migrants coming over the border as that reason, right? Um, and a lot of ways to sort of cut through that is what I've seen on picket lines, um, is to point out and seek uh, that common ground, economic common ground, and then introducing those intersections that create more of a nuanced conversation, right? Um, and I've seen a lot of folks who on picket lines who say, you know, I voted for Trump, but this sucks, right? I don't know what's going on. Um, and ostensibly leftist individuals, either from outside coming in to support pickets or their own coworkers will sit on a picket line and they will talk to each other and they will come to a, a much more nuanced conversation about what the issue is and how to fight that, right? Um, and to step away from the fear that comes from, uh, you know, uh, a migrant crisis, whatever, you know, sort of boogeyman you want to throw at it. Um, and I think that's an important thing to, to sort of think about in our own organizing as well, is that these are oftentimes one-on-one -on -one conversations that take a lot of effort um, that our each person is important to talk to, right? And there is no, there's no one size fits all solution to that. Um, and there's no sort of pointing towards electoralism as like our savior, right? It really just takes those conversations, those building of that community, either within your hemisphere, your region or your shop floor, right? And that is the way to kind of move forward. Um, and it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna be quick. Um, and that's just been my experience as I've talked to workers across the country. I now live in Los Angeles and I'm, you know, reaching out to a whole new group of people that I personally, living in the Midwest, did not have a chance to interact with. Um, and it's the same thing across the state borders all the way across this country. So um, that's just kind of my thoughts. And, um, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to talk about this. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Belle. Your work is really great. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I think just to build off of what a lot of people have, say, um, have been saying, including the last person, I am a social worker at one of the city public hospitals in New York and at the primary care clinics there. So, you know, I see most of the patients that I see every day are older people on social security, um, people surviving on just some form of disability income, people with really limited income from employment or just really um, precarious work situations. And it's just so interesting a lot of times, I mean, probably some days multiple times I'm having conversations with people where they're telling me how they're struggling, they're barely getting by, they're either not able to pay their rent at all, um, or they're barely able to every month and are trying to get help, and I have to tell them that like there is no program that can help them <laughs> most of the time. Um, and people will say like, and then I'm barely paying my rent, or I, you know, I'm barely getting by, and there's all these people coming to the city, and they get everything, and they get housing, and there's, I mean, there's so much fear mongering, there's so much misinformation out there, and I can tell people 
that's actually not how it works. You know, a lot of them don't get health care. A lot of them don't get, you know, people that are living on the street as soon as they've been in a shelter and like a lot of them can't work. And, but there's so much, yeah, there's so much misinformation out there and people kind of instantly pit themselves against one another, right? So part of, I guess, how I understand like everyday anti-fascism is like trying to expand people's political imaginations like there is a world, <laughs> there could be a world where you can afford your rent and these other people can also have a safe place to live. Um, and a, a, like some of these people too, like it'll be like, I'm barely paying my rent, I can't, you know, I can't get by and I tell them, okay, you can apply for food stamps. And sometimes people say, I'm not, I don't need food stamps. I'm not that type of person. And I'm like, you are, you clearly are. This, then you can get, then you can, you know, feed yourself, you can feed your family and um, it's just so interesting, you know, these, they're so deeply ingrained and, you know, when we're talking about like getting to know people and why they're thinking the way they're thinking, it's like, there's so much, um, you know, the culture of individualism is, is so, so horrible, has so many repercussions for people and um, I guess just, I mean, it, I, I think it, it, it is a little bit of empathy, but it's also like trying to help people get out of just the, the daily grind of like, you know, they're barely getting by, but like there is a different way to live and there is, there is, you know, a possibility that we could have a world where we can all have things we need. All right. <clears throat> um, well, first this was, this has been a great talk, so I want to thank everyone. Um, so uh, my name's Christian. I'm, I live in Chicago. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican. I'm also very like ardently been pro-Palestinian for as ever since I learned what Palestine was and learned about the history there. Um, you know, and I come from a very rich family of like rich culturally um, Puerto Rican family of just resistance and kind of not necessarily you know socialist, communist, whatever, but more like nationalist. Um, you know, one of my deals, one of my uncles was a member of the Young Lords Party here in Chicago, um, which is awesome and great. Um, and I just want to sort of sp kind of expanding on the the talk that we were having about border fascism specifically. When there are groups of people, um, countries, cultural identities, like Puerto Ricans, which are, I think, one of the oldest still existing colonies in human history that you know is still here, to, still here today. When I think about the Palestinian struggle, how do we sort of fight border fascism and stand against it while we simultaneously try to include and fight for our comrades all over the world who haven't even secured their borders to begin with, like who haven't, who don't even have the first stage of that. Because um, I think of Fanon and I think of Wretched of the Earth, which is like the fundamental decolonial piece where he basically asserts that the, the first, one of the first stages towards a socialist struggle for an oppressed people are, is the nationalist struggle, even if it necessarily isn't explicitly socialist in the first stages. So I'm just wondering, is, that, is, is there a contradiction there between trying to fight for a people's, their struggle, and also fighting f against the clear-cut fascist borders that, you know, the imperialists, the colonialists, all those. Um, so yeah, I hope that that was kind of the question there. Thank you. That is such a good question. <laughs> um, I feel that what, how I, how I am hearing your question and how I'm understanding and starting to think about your question is basically what does the, what is the form, what is the shape of the decolonial struggle today, of the anti-colonial struggle today, and the, like, and the, nation, the national question today um, in, in a place like Puerto Rico, in a place like Palestine, in, frankly, it's back on the table in a place like Ireland, where uh, there are 
questions back on the agenda about the border between the Republic and the North. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from thinkers like Fanon about the national question and the struggle for national liberation and the relation between those movements and those struggles and a international, transnational, regional, hemispheric, global working class and movement for liberation. Something that is sort of a complicating factor in that, I think, not, not doesn't negate it, it's just another layer, is the fact that Fanon was writing to a different, a very different conjuncture than the one that we are in now, and a different kind of international order of sovereign states, where, sure, it is, it is, it is, it is doubtless true that the kind of um, ideologues of neoliberalism and globalization have overstated the uh, the flatness of the earth and <laughs> the ease of movement between between states, and and um, over overemphasized the um, interconnectedness of it, of it all. Even going so far as to claim that like the nation state as a, as a form is entering a period of obsolescence. Clearly not true for my money. But what is true is that there has been a proliferation not only of borders but of, of, of corridors and of logistical spaces that penetrate, disrupt national borders, which is also part of the production of anxiety about national identity, right? Um, that produces this kind of border fascism and this hyper-nationalism. And all of that is also in, in, in service of the extraction of, of value and profit from places like Puerto Rico and Palestine. The, across the global south, so how to how to think those things together, the kind of changing character and nation or character of the national form and the form of nationalist movements um, and how that relates to the broader question of fighting the far right and the forces of reaction which play on national identity. Boy, I tell you, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a, really, it's a really great question, and I am excited to think about it more. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? We'll take three more questions. Did I miss a hand? I don't think so. No? All right. Well, I'll, I'll ask one then. Um, <clears throat> so you, you kind of, you closed your talk talking about e everyday anti-fascism, and some of us have, have, have some of you all brought, brought this up in your comments and questions. Um, you, you raised an example of what that might look like in, in, in the form of, you know, what you all did in your organizing. Um, on the job um, and with your, 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 your boss's funding of a anti-trans film. Um, but I'm wondering like what else that might look like and how do we begin to engender an everyday anti-fascism, not just on the left, but I think like more broadly because I think the, you know, the, the problem I think l lies perhaps a little bit more with like the, the depoliticized um, with people who do not think of themselves necessarily as political actors um, who have like the agency to do anything about this. Um, you know, and you've talked already a little bit about the necessity of like building organization, not just in the flow, but in the ebb. So I'm wondering like, you know, maybe you could expand a little bit on, on, on everyday anti-fascism. Yeah. Um Again, I, I, I worry that this is going to sound like a dodge, but I 
really do believe it, that it is, as you say, the problem of, de of, of disorganization and depoliticization. Um, and that in order to put an anti-fascist or an abolitionist politics into practice, you need organizations and tools with which to do it. Uh, that these are politics that maybe don't, maybe, uh, you know, I, I have, had, had spent some time thinking about like, and reading, reading people who were thinking about like, what is the form of abolitionist organization? And maybe that's kind of the wrong question. <laughs> like maybe that abolitionist politics and anti-fascist politics are a kind of politics that are, that exist in practice and exist in movement through through other organizational forms, through the form of a, of a, of a labor union, of a tenant union, that it's in the, the relations that grow out of those uh, out, out of those organizations that people begin to think about and figure out what an, what everyday anti-fascism means in their particular circumstances. Um, because what an everyday anti-fascism means in New York City is going to be different than what it means in Tucson. Uh, and so that is going to, re that will require, that will require investigation of the conditions on the ground. Um, I think that, like not, not to be, not to be uh, economistic about it, but I do think that like workplace organizing and tenant organizing are where it all begins. <laughs> like, and everything else is putting the cart before the horse. Like we need the organization in order for these questions to have any stakes, <laughs> to have any meaning, to, to, to begin to experiment and to figure out like, all right, well, we have this idea about the world, but it doesn't actually work like that in practice. People are not responding. People are not <laughs> doing what we expect them to do. It happens all the time. Um, so I think that, so I think that an everyday anti-fascism then requires this kind of, what some people refer to as, as base building, um, which is a term that I under, understand the utility of, but I'm a little bit leery about. Uh, but to build up the density of proletarian organizations in order to experiment with these ideas and to start to build these ideas in practice and to do so in a way that we can think about defending against reaction in a way that undercuts that reaction so that it's not just about fighting in the street but about keeping them from getting into the street to begin with. <laughs> Um, thinking several steps ahead, thinking about okay, how does this how does this victory set us up for the next one? Um, this to, this to me is what is what an everyday anti-fascism looks like, and thinking about how thinking about capital is going to react because it's always going to be a push and pull. Um, and I think that this is part of the, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that this is what we lose when we overemphasize the electoral, <laughs> basically, um, to, to, our, to our great detriment. Yeah. I think I, I echo what a couple of the other questioners, commenters mentioned, that it, um, it just seems like a lot of the roots of this fascism are in deprivation, right? I mean, cities like Youngstown and other Rust Belt cities that have had jobs taken away, you know, uh, you mentioned organizing rent, you know, rents that can't be paid. Um, and it just seems like to undo the roots of what attracts people to, to fascism is to, to make people's material conditions better and you know and so there's deprivation materially but there's also this loss of status that people feel because 
you know, brown people are coming over the border. I'm losing my status as a white person. Um, and so I'm not sure how to, <laughs> to relieve that deprivation. But I think if we can relieve the economic deprivation, it, it keeps people from being attracted to, to fascist leaders and, and groups and movements. Yeah, and I think also, just like, uh, this is not a disagreement, this is a, an, an addition, is that mm, addressing, addressing deprivation and material conditions, yes, absolutely. I think also important to understand or recall or remember that what the destruction of the already pretty threadbare social safety net does to people and people's imagination about what might happen to them, what might happen to their families, is that it makes the consequences of losing a job, losing a house, existential. So even if you have a house, <laughs> even if you have a job, the the maw gapes <laughs> beneath you. Yeah. And the fear and the anxiety that that is going to induce in people has to go, like it's gonna go somewhere. And so, yes, addressing those material concerns directly, absolutely necessary, improving conditions on the, on the job, you know, making sure that people can stay in their homes of whatever nature, but also making it so that if somebody does lose a job, it's not life or death. Um, and that they are not worried about new arrivals to a, to, to a city kind of taking something away because, because it, it, it becomes, it becomes more possible to imagine shared flourishing and shared, maybe not abundance, but livelihood. Um, yeah. And the fascists pose immigration as an existential threat, right? So everyone feels like, you know, if I don't do something, if I don't arm, then, you know, or, you know, um, then our way of life in our country is going to be destroyed. Yeah. So, yeah. Anybody else? Why don't you, why don't you go, because you haven't spoken yet. And then you can go. All right, thanks. Hi. Um, so... I'm going to be a little all over the place, but I'll get to my point. Like, <laughs> I remember um, four years ago, some friends and I were talking, and one of my friends, it was like fine, just talking about kind of like we're all somewhere on the left talking about just drinking, talking about life, and she had brought some rando date, and he, out of the blue, said like, I'm against open borders, like apropos of nothing, and I was kind of like, what? But it was obvious to me that this was coming from Fox News or there was some big like right wing and that was my first maybe um, eye open to that. Um, uh, um, I was, I appreciate what you were saying. Like, I think um, talking to people like, uh, well, hold on. I just want to, one more little anecdote. Like my dad maybe on the other hand is like a liberal. He's definitely a boomer. Um, and uh, and uh, a Jewish person who's pro-Palestine and a boomer, you know, kind of on the left of some things, but I brought up the new policy. I can't, I don't know if there is like an official name to it where, but where asylum seekers have to like apply for asylum in other countries before they get to, the, I, I was infuriated, but he's like, oh, that makes sense. So there's this kind of turn with the liberals too, where liberals are like falling for this anti-immigrant propaganda. And, um, like when you were talking about talking to workers, I've talked to a lot of workers. I've done the electoral politics thing and probably knocked tens of thousands of doors and talked to tens of thousands of folks. And 
like honestly working class people I've been on picket lines talking to people and made huge strides one person I actually had knocked a door and pulled some very like out of the blue was talking about like Russia invading and so, like out of nowhere I was knocking doors for a city council person it was very wild but he happened to be a striking worker and I, I remembered him he did not remember me and I was like oh my god and he was you know you show up and they're just so excited to talk to you and I was like this guy just talked at me for 45 minutes without realizing like I'm the one he had posted on next door about um uh but like and you were talking about like um, Alejandro's great question and there being no playbook but like fascism's here it's having slowly and then quickly and like more and more quickly and so um, I guess like one of the things I'm always thinking about is like we all only have so much time in our day and it's like where do we choose to spend it and with whom do we choose to spend it is like my dad, like the boomer liberal, a complete waste of time because like he's also propagandized by news, like, you know, people we don't know. Like, I mean, to me, it seems like um, when I say the working class, like the real working class, not like maybe my dad, who's not the 1%, like, but he's able to retire, you know, owns a house, doesn't ever have to worry about money. But um, those like in the struggle clearly those around us but it's like you know things could happen six months from now things could happen maybe it could take another five years um i don't know but kind of and and you've addressed that a little bit but um maybe like like that's very micro like your exact workplace but like maybe on a little bit larger scale like class wise um um, that would be my question. Thank you. Briefly, I think there are no wasted conversations. <laughs> uh, either you learn something about the way that somebody is thinking or they learn something. <laughs> Maybe both. Um, class and I mean and also kind of scaling it up we want to build hegemony <laughs> right and that is going to that will require winning classes and fractions of classes beyond what we understand narrowly as the working class the real working class as you said um, in an organizing campaign, if you're using the labor notes model, you've got your ones, your twos, your threes, your fours, and your fives. But you're always working to get people, wherever, they, where, wherever somebody is on, on that scale, like, you have to know that they can always move between, <laughs> between, between one point and the other. You have to always be working on them. Um, nothing is fixed, nothing is static. And I think that, I don't know, I think we sort of have to bring that energy to the kind of, movement, kind of movement that we are trying to build. Um, obviously, there are always going to be, there are some people and there are some class fractions that are just always going to be fives. <laughs> but you have to know who they are, right? And you know who they are by talking to them. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but thank you for it anyway. I think we're and we're at time. At time. That's yeah. a good place to end. Thank you. I Thanks want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for your questions and comments. I want to thank Brendan uh, for his talk, and I want to remind you that Blood Red Lines on Nativism Fuels the Right is available right over there at the shop. <laughs>